Hello, everyone. My name is Mei-Ling Kopecki. I am a biracial white and Chinese woman in her 20s with long brown hair wearing a burnt orange, I suppose, sweater. Um, I'd like to start by thanking MFA Program Director Ellen Mueller, Administrative Assistant Kylie Van Note, my mentor Michael Banning, my thesis committee members Professor Clarence Morgan and Dr. Jessica Dandona, MFA instructors Stevie Ada Clark and Peng Wu, my MFA peers, and my super supportive family. Okay, moving. Hang on, I gotta click on the screen. All right. So as a person with a disability, I'd first like to say happy International Day of Persons with Disabilities. This wasn't planned. It just conveniently fell on the same day I'm giving this presentation. Yeah. Yay. So what is disability? The Americans with Disabilities Act defines disability as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. And this covers a wide range of conditions, many of which are invisible such as my disability, which is multiple sclerosis or MS. I first showed clear signs of it when I was 13 and I was diagnosed at 15. And then here are some lovely photos of my teenage years. For those of you who aren't familiar with MS, it is an autoimmune disorder that affects the central nervous system. So the immune system damages the myelin sheath, which is the protective coating on nerve cells, and that affects the nerve's ability to transfer signals. Also, only three to 5% of all individuals with MS will experience disease onset before the age of 16. Not many people know this, um, and because of kind of this lack of awareness and the invisible nature of MS and my youngness, I was often met with a lot of skepticism when talking about my illness. I was told that I looked fine or that I was too young to be sick. And this led to a lot of imposter syndrome and also trouble with asking for the accommodations that I needed. So this inspired me to start creating artwork about my experiences with MS. I do this in order to spread awareness, educate the public and advocate for myself and others with invisible illnesses. I also want to mention a couple other artists with MS whose work has inspired me. Tina Stern, for example, overcomes her loss of mobility by creating abstract finger paintings that convey a sense of movement. A former dancer herself, these paintings are often inspired by music. And then Gary Canone, I believe that's how you say it, creates sculptures and installations that make the viewer feel uncomfortable. For example, and I think you can see my cursor. On the left here, we have a chair that is made out of butcher paper and tape. I would collapse if you sat on it. The center, we have these ceramic plates that are attached to the ceiling. So you feel like they might fall at any time. And then here we have these concrete slabs that if you played hopscotch on would probably make you trip. And this all reflects how uncertain, fragile and uncomfortable it can feel to navigate the world with MS. When I first started sharing my experiences with MS through my art, I focused more on my relationship with medical spaces. So I look at photos I've taken during visits to the doctor or hospital and mentally edit them as I paint, creating images that show how these spaces have grown to feel familiar. And then last fall, I also decided to experiment with animating my paintings and adding music, which I composed myself. I'm also a musician, so I'll just show very briefly. A little bit of this. So for the sake of time, I'll just stop there. Um, I wanted to add the movement and music to better convey the sort of melancholy but calm mood that I feel in those spaces. I also explore the proof of my disability. As I mentioned before, since I look healthy on the outside, uh, people have been very skeptical of the fact that I'm actually sick. So while you can't see the damage when you look at me, you can see it in the MRI scans. So while the digital images of the scans are only about 400 pixels wide, but very small, I paint them at roughly the same size as my head to provide a better sense of context. These are three examples of recent MRI paintings that I've done with watercolor and gouache on black paper. Each bright spot or lesion is where my immune system has attacked my brain. And then this painting, you can see there's two scans from 2010 on the left, two from 2020 on the right, and you can more clearly see the progression of the damage. 
The reason I choose to paint these skins rather than just show them is because I find painting to be a very intimate act. And through the process of painting and just studying these skins in great detail, I'm addressing my own discomfort and imposter syndrome and kind of validating to myself my own symptoms and what I feel. Yeah. Work in the video there. All right. So moving on to talk about the symptoms. Um, they can also prevent me from making work, unfortunately. So in order to address this, I began to create these very quick, small symptom sketches. I make the sketches as I'm experiencing MS symptoms resulting in mark making that reflects my physical state. For example, if I have a migraine, I create darker, more rushed strokes, or if I'm fatigued, I often create lighter and softer strokes. So here's an example of sketches I made over spring semester. And then here are five sketches of my hand that I did during a typical Monday through Friday work week, dealing with various symptoms each day. By creating these sketches and documenting my symptoms in this journalistic manner, I reflect the chronic nature of MS. It doesn't go away and it can affect you daily. I also create more involved drawings of MS symptoms. These are done on translucent matte Duralar, layering different pieces on top of each other to reflect the barriers I face in day-to-day -day life. I also want to mention that most of the pieces on the last five slides are currently in my solo exhibition, Invisible Obstacles, which will be up in the MCAD gallery for one more week. So if you want to go see them in person, you can go check that out. Moving forward, I'm going to be doing a lot more symptom work like this painting that shows what double vision can look like. And also this drawing that reflects how it can feel to have heat intolerance, which is a fairly common MS symptom that I struggle with a lot during the summer. As I was creating all of this work related to my disability, it occurred to me that I hadn't heard much about disability art prior to my current research. And I learned that there's a phenomenon called the disability art ghetto, which pretty much refers to how disability art has historically existed in somewhat of a bubble or echo chamber with it being primarily viewed by other patients with disabilities. There's a certain specificity, I suppose, about disability art that makes it not necessarily as appealing to the general public. To combat this, I um, share my work on accessible online platforms like Instagram, a lot of other users who just like art, as well as organizations like the National MS Society share my work and it's able to reach a broader audience. I also try to exhibit my work as much as possible, which allows me to network with other people. I've had the privilege of meeting 14 other young artists with disabilities as part of the Kennedy Center's VSA Emerging Young Artists Program, many of whom also share my vision of using our art as a form of disability advocacy. So hopefully that's a good sign and moving forward into the future, this sort of work will reach a wider audience. Then to close things out on today, the International Day of Persons with Disabilities, I just really want to stress the importance of disability awareness. According to the CDC, 26% of the adults in the United States live with a disability. And then to the educators present, as well as those who want to eventually work in higher education, nearly 20% or one in five every undergraduate college, the one in every five undergraduate college students reported having a disability in the 2015-2016 school year, and that is increasing. Here at MCAD, it's over 20%. Last I checked, it was 22%. And in her article, Becoming Disabled, which I will link to in the chat after this, Rosemary Garland Thompson states, the fact is most of us will move in and out of disability in our lifetimes, whether we do so through illness, an injury, or merely the process of aging. Becoming disabled demands the awareness and cooperation of others who don't experience these challenges. Becoming disabled means moving from isolation to community, from ignorance to knowledge about who we are, from exclusion to access, and from shame to pride. Thank you. And then here's a little animation of the process of my painting. Thank you, Mei Ling. That was great. Um, Wonderful. And I'm glad we get to watch this while people are thinking, oh, and we've already got a question. All right. So Lucas asks, I feel we share a similar scenario of creating a representation of an experience versus a recording of our experience. Which of these do you feel better shares your experience or is it a combo? A representation versus a recording. Um, yeah, I feel like it's both, honestly. Like, for example, the symptom sketches, I am kind of recording what's happening to me by documenting it like that. 
But at the same time, you know, it is a visual representation of what I'm going through. It's not like I can really physically share the feeling. So yeah, if that answers your question. I'm sorry, I'm trying to find the chat and I can't see it anywhere. That's okay. You got right to the heart of it, which was okay. that representation versus recording. So wonderful. Um, and we'll, we'll give people a moment to compose their thoughts and questions. Uh, in the meantime, Mailing, you had mentioned a really great article, um, and now if you do have the link at your disposal, yeah. it would be awesome. Okay, I, ju I just found the chat. It was on the other screen. Okay. okay. <laughs> I have read that article, and it's excellent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I love all of Rosemary Garland Thompson's writing. It's just so, I highly recommend. Absolutely. And I'm glad you mentioned too that you you are quite active on those Instagram audiences and and reaching out beyond um, just here at MCAD. Uh, have you have you thought and reflected on that at all uh, recently? Like, what are your plans after graduation in terms of continuing to reach audience? Yeah, I mean, I well, I'm going to remain active on Instagram for one thing. That's actually gotten me a lot of opportunities. But the National MS Society recently reached out to me about doing something in their magazine. Um, also, I would like to get other MS patients involved with my research moving forward. Right now, it's been mainly about my symptoms, but I've been talking to a couple other young patients with MS about their symptoms and trying to visualize that. So I think that my practice will be including more of an interview aspect to it. Um, so just trying to really relate and interact with the communities in that way is kind of what I'm going to be doing soon. Wonderful. Oh, here's a question. Dan asks, educating seems to be an important part of your practice, both in terms of raising disability awareness and teaching art to students. Can you talk about what makes education so important to you? Yeah, I mean, a lot of that is background. I come from three generations of professors <laughs> and my family is all about, you know, education and school and um, I just I feel like the more people know and the more people understand the more the better things are I guess I, I guess that's a very broad answer to that question but yeah I and I think that the way I want to do it with my work is that I want to educate people about these problems but use myself as a case study you know um Sorry, I, that doesn't answer no, your question. That, that's great. That's, that's really great. Um, next question we have is from Michael Banning. And um, he's asking, Mei Ling, your work is really satisfying to experience as an art art, art artifact. Um, but a lot of the way the work functions is about the conversations it creates and the connections you make with people. Do you see it as a kind of social practice? And do you use that, that terminology to describe your practice? Yeah, I feel like in general, my practice right now, it's not just about the art making, it is also about the advocacy and being involved with my community. So in that way, yes, it also functions as social practice. But at the same time, it's like arts practice as research. And it's just, so yes, um, it's just many of like the different ways, one of the many different ways I would describe the work. It's layered. Thank you. All right. And then we've got one more question here from Stevie. The seriality of your work is so important. Can you speak more to working serially? Have you located any artists who work serially that work in a way that relates to your practice? Yeah, I, yes, I have considered, um, actually, some of my classmates also have recommended making like books and kind of uh, documenting my work in that sort of way. Um, I am thinking of an artist that for some reason I cannot remember the name of right now. Okay. Um, but yes, I am very interested in that way of working that sort of like the daily practice. Um, actually, one of my mentors, Clarence Morgan, in his recent exhibition at the Burnett Gallery in Wayzata, um, was doing these sketches uh, during the like pandemic drawings. Um, I think that it's just a really... I love documentation. I've always loved documentation. I've been journaling since I was a very small child. So yeah, I, I, I can't remember the other artist name. I'm sorry. That's <laughs> I'll message okay. you when I remember it. Absolutely. And I want to give folks a chance if you want to take a wellness break right now and stretch or get up, 
feel free, but we've got one more question mailing. Are you okay taking that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. We've got a question from Anda. Do you consider the digital representations of your work as a different iteration of the physical work? Is it a satisfactory outcome if a viewer interacts exclusively with the work online? I have been thinking about that a lot. I yeah. don't have an actual answer to that question because, and I, and Anda, I know you and I have discussed this before, the scale of the work is very important to me. And just the fact that it's so small lends it to be being viewed as like a precious object, but also very accessible. And scale isn't something that, for example, if you're just looking on your phone, you really get the um, vibe of. And I'm also moving more into installation moving forward. So it is something I'm grappling with. I, as right now with my work, I'm okay with it being viewed online. And I feel like that's fine because it is all two dimensional, but as I make it more interactive and, and installation based, it's gonna, yeah, we'll see. Wonderful. All right, well, we'll take a short break now. And um, at 11.20, we will come back for Jordan's presentation. So everybody feel free to stretch, do what you need to do, and we'll start at 11.20. Oh my gosh. And I just realized we forgot to give Mei-Lang a round of applause. If anybody's still there, go ahead and give a round of applause. Many congrats. <laughs> there we go.